Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the SoFi Weekly. Today, I'm here welcomed by two special guests, Roy at cross underscore roads and Tevis. Uh, another guest that we have, Tevis. Now, the great and powerful Roy is here. Uh, no. <laughs> the great uh, and powerful. Just check from everyone. What's that? Celsius check. Oh yeah, yeah. I got uh, I got a little peach vibe today. Yeah. Uh, had to hunt for this one. I was actually kind of surprised. Uh, it was like hidden in back on a top shelf, and there were not a lot of uh, Celsius. So not an investor yet, not a sponsor. But if if uh, Celsius wants to sponsor us, I don't think we'll turn that down. We will so, not turn it down. We'll try it. Um, Tevis, I didn't I didn't see a I didn't see a Celsius. Oh no, I'm drinking a Celsius. What flavor? Oh. Are we vibing? <laughs> yeah. We're vibing? All right. Yeah, Tanner, so. what you got? Tropical vibe. You'll never see me with a peach vibe or, or not often. Um, because I I trade them out with my girlfriend. I say, you take the peaches and I'll take the orange and the tropicals. So I try to get rid of them if I can. They're not my favorite. <laughs> Where's your straw, Tanner? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's a good one. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit of SoFi, and then we can wrap this crap up and then get into uh, <laughs> Tesla. Tesla news. <laughs> Tesla Weekly. Yeah. No, actually, there's a, a lot of exciting things. We've got a couple different analyst reports this, uh, this um, week. We also saw pretty interesting stuff happening with their credit cards. A lot of people saying that their credit limits are getting cut uh bank earnings today so that was pretty interesting for seeing their deposits and where loans are going these sort of things and we'll see more of that information next week as well um did you guys also see the dan dole of uh video that happened today yeah so he actually thinks that personal loans will accelerate and actually see a growth year over year no no contraction so i thought that that was interesting um, Tevis, what else would you like to talk about, my friend? Uh, short interest came in uh, mm. for this week. Uh, there's also the partnerships with Wyndham Clark and the NAR the, that happened this week. Uh, we can talk about the you know Biden plan to talk uh, to cancel student loans if we have nothing else to talk about. But yeah, lots of topics. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Uh, where should we start? Do you think? Student loans? Student loans. Biden's student loans. Are you guys worried? Uh, he's talking about cutting, you know, ton of loans that might even affect up to 30 million uh, students. Or yeah, was it 20 million? It, no, 30 million. And it's, uh, a lot of these are people that have been paying for a while. Um, usually they'll, they'll grab further than they actually are able to do. Uh, so I, I don't know that 30 million people have their loans forgiven. It's not guaranteed. We've seen that this is a, a battle as well, you know, politically somewhat, uh, but uh, in the courts as well. So those that are will just have the, the loans that they've issued just be forgiven. You know, they, they're not always happy and thrilled with that. So time will tell. But, you know, largest, largely this is a uh, political lever that can be pushed to uh, get a few more votes. So I think that's mostly what it is. Um, we'll have to see. I was actually surprised as many, uh, went through as previously as before. So, but, you know, as far as student loans, I know we'll have our predictions a little bit closer to earnings time. Uh, I'm not expecting much from that segment really until we get to the third quarter. Uh, we might, I think we'll start to see that ramping up. And then the fourth quarter, we're going to see a lot of that as some of those penalties really start hitting. Uh, but for now it's tough. It, it, it really, uh, interest rates need to start getting cut to, for that segment to grow. So far I'll do fine if interest rates aren't cut, but, uh, yeah, I mean, who wants to refinance <laughs> at the current interest rates? I, a few people, but, uh, most people won't be helped by it necessarily. So. Yeah. The, the way that I said about it on the channel most recently is that I think, you know, the, the people with the 780 plus FICOs and, uh, 170,000 plus, uh, income doesn't really fall under a lot of the, stipulations that biden had laid out and so i really don't think that this is the same demographic that uh biden is talking about right these are people that 
really need the the cuts versus the people who would really prefer the cuts, which is more leaning on the side of uh, SoFi's demographic. Um, Tevis, I see that you're out twenty dollars. What just happened? Yeah, I bet on this dud, Wyndham Clark. I also just I, I watched <laughs> I watched them the other day and I was like I don't understand like anything that's going on. They're just like I was like oh oh he, he's on he's on and then he was on for five minutes hit one and then he wasn't on for like another two hours. I was like yeah you know uh, I don't I don't get the I was like googling what is a birdie what is plus one like anyways. Um, well, you really don't know golf to that degree. No. Okay. I know that they have to get it in the hole in as few hits as possible. So I true. Don't, I don't. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know anything else beyond that. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, okay. So student loans. Glad, glad the program is working. I'm, I I thought for a second it wasn't working, but I made sure it was on, and it is on. So Tevis will get highlighted if he does laugh. Sorry, it doesn't really work with Roy. But with Tevis, it does work. But if he's blocking his mouth, it might not work. We'll have to see. It's definitely a smile. Uh, see, there it goes. All right. Um, are, are we still talking about student loans? Can I? Can yeah. I yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it really matters uh, for student loans. Like they did this in the midterm, and they're running the same playbook now. And we know what happened after the midterm. Nothing happened. It got shot down. And really, the message to be telegraphed to ordinary everyday people is don't hold your breath don't get your hopes up because this is not something that the president has in his sole discretion to forgive um he needs a whole bunch of hoops to jump through in terms of approvals and this is just a promise it's a very well-timed promise unfortunately a lot of people are going to go for that I, I saw this post on um you know, on X, where after Biden sort of made the tweet or his team or whatever made the tweet that they're, you know, canceling 7.4 billion or something to that effect, the comments were like, oh, I wonder what states uh, these students live in. Because, and I think that's so telling in terms of, okay, this is a promise that's forward looking. It's not like, you know, it's going to happen tomorrow. And it already got shot down once. So what makes you hopeful that it's going to happen again? And then the other thing to mention is that the only, the main negative for SoFi the first time around was the moratorium, which is not on the table to be coming back. Student loan forgiveness doesn't apply to SoFi's core ideal customer profile, their core demographic. It's more affluent, higher earners. Um, so they wouldn't even fall under that loan forgiveness, regardless of what Kamala Harris says that they're going to forgive literally everybody regardless of income. I don't think that's a very feasible plan. So anyways, it's pretty much just lip service in my opinion. You're on mute. Sorry, I was shaking the, the, the cup, so I muted. Um, I did want to go on to, now that we have 200 plus people, uh, thank you all for being here. I wanted to ask you guys, do you guys think, just for your own portfolios, not not uh, sort of a strategy for, for anyone else, really, but SoFi has had a track record going into earnings of potentially beating the stock moving uh, double digits in percentages for potentially a short period of time, usually one day or potentially one week. Um is this something that you guys think is a potential trade for yourselves? Um, I can go with my trade, but um, for me, it was just, so my plan, if we go to $10 plus for this earnings, I'm probably going to cut some of the January 2025 leaps because that's going to be back in uh, profit. Right now it's not because we've just been sort of going horizontal for such a long time in the $7 range for a couple of months now. And so the, the decay on those is getting ugly. Um, I'm either going to take the proceeds from that and buy 2026 sleeps or buy underlying shares at whatever the price is, you know, $10, $9 doesn't really matter. I mean, I bought at $10, $9 before, so I'm not really shying away from that for a long-term hold. But in terms of those January 2025s, 
depending on the strike price, I have 15s, I have 10s, and I have fives, I think. Uh, depending on the strike price, I'm probably going to reduce my risk in those leaps, and I'm still going to keep the 2026s on. Right? Yeah, I, I'm kind of similar. Um, I With the 2025s, we're not quite there yet, but I, I start to look at rolling those out further uh, if they've not done what I wanted. I've already sold uh, in the past leaps and I bought them back again. So I think that my initial outlay is covered, but no, if we run up again, I'm going to look for an opportunity, just like Tevis uh, had said, to either buy the underlying stock. I'll probably do cash secure puts. And if they don't land like I expect as we fall back down, I'll either I'll, I'll probably shift some into 2026 20, leaps or just shares. And it'll probably be a combination of both, most likely. I, I don't, um, the money's all going to go back into SoFi one way or another. I, I'm not uh, leaving but, SoFi just because we get to like 10 bucks or nine bucks or <clears> 11 <throat> again. I don't know. Uh, the other thing that I'm doing as well, and I, I it's it's a gamble. Um, I don't always do this. Maybe I'll, like once a quarter. I've done it a little bit more often this year. Uh, made a short term bet. And so I, I have June. Um, I'm not sure uh, what the date is there in June. It's the quarterly date uh, for $10 strikes. And I, I have like, I don't know, 25 um, call options. So nothing too serious. And I'll take them off the table if they don't end up running. and I'll lose a little bit of money. That's fine. Uh, but no, if, if we fly up after earnings, like I expect, I'll take some money uh, from that and I'll buy more SoFi. So, but it's just, it's trading SoFi for SoFi. And, uh, you know, I think that it's stocks, I mean, they have personalities and we know what SoFi's personality is. We're not the only ones that know it. You know, even people that don't follow it very closely um, just know this repeated pattern that's lasted a few years now where it pops up because it was a, is a triple beat again. Uh, and then the stock comes back down. One of these days, the pattern will break. It could even be this earnings. What I'm very confident of is it's going to be a triple beat. What I'm not confident of is a stock price action, just because so many people know it, predict it. Some people will absolutely front run it. Uh, and so, you know, if if we get a run up into earnings before earnings, I will take some of those uh, July, not July, June uh, strikes off the table, too, just because I know some people will try to be front running that just because it's a, a predictable thing. But I don't know. Anything could happen. Short term bets. It's It's an absolute gamble. The leaps. I just, once I get about six months out, I really start looking to, to roll those out. And by three months, I'm out of them completely or I've rolled them. So it's about so that type of look. The thing to note there is that we can very easily spot the pattern at this point. It doesn't take, you know, a market expert because it's repeated so frequently over the past you know, couple of years. The more that it repeats in that range the harder it is to break out of it because you have the psychology working against you and mm -hmm. i think when it does break 10 or or i think the high is like 11.7 something like that then people will start piling in the algorithms will pick it up and it has a potential to go much higher but that's the critical point where you have all of that selling pressure when you hit 10 because everybody has seen the pattern play out four times successfully now that it hits 10 and it goes back to seven. And so they're going to be immediately putting in sell orders and putting that downward pressure on the stock. So you need something really, really strong to help it reach that escape velocity out of that range. And I think I know what that is. As far as the actual stock, I'm not sure, but SoFi doesn't have a significant amount of institutional ownership. It's when the institutions are like, hey, this is it we're buying and it's it's other than kathy wood kathy wood will trade in and out um just like retail honestly but most institutions are not like that they will buy and continue to buy and continue to buy and just hold for like 10 years uh and buy a little bit in and out here once you know whatever sofi does that impresses institutions enough where they start coming in in droves and i think we're not too far away from that point as a business that's when it will break the pattern absolutely well, I think, yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add that. Um, you know what? I think that we're in an area that's changing. We're going from a non profitable company, still labeled non profitable. And the more quarters we put behind us, the more that, you know, SoFi will be labeled, labeled a profitable, sustainable company. Um, 
I don't think that the the fluctuation is going to continue. I mean, the the pattern might continue for two more quarters or something like this of you know these large bounces, but I think that um, SoFi will get treated differently because there will be new institutions that have uh, that availability of buying them. So, I don't know. Tevis, you were going to say something? Uh, I was going to say that I think it's a good opportunity for us to pivot and talk about some of these analyst re ratings. What we've been seeing over the past two weeks is analysts have been uh, re rating SoFi higher in terms of their price targets. And SoFi is now forming, you know, if you go on to tip ranks or whatever, if you went on six months ago, you would say, here's the average analyst ratings. It's going to be like 850. And if you go on today, it's going to be higher because, you know, City, Deutsche, all of the, like even um, KBW uh, went back to 750 and everybody is just going a little higher. Interestingly, they're all going higher because of the 2029 convertible notes. Um, but that's going to help change the narrative around the stock to the point where I think Barron's even called it a tech stock this week. I was like, what? Um, Surprising. Right. So that and along with short interest. So we can dive into two of those. But uh, Tanner, do we want a special guest to bring on? Uh, I would like a special guest. All right. I'll send them the invite. Okay. Are you talking about the guest that I talked about? I would love a special guest. Um, <laughs> and it's not like a general, Roy is like, is this the, the multi-camera joke or something? <laughs> uh, that was no. the ultimate special guest. <laughs> what? That was the extra. Oh yeah. Somebody said, Steve, please. It's not him, but when he is back and one day he will come back, he will be back. To remember to do that. Bookmark that. That's a great idea. Everyone, Jamie please Dimon. welcome Jamie Dimon. <laughs> <laughs> So imagine. Can you imagine? Yeah, congrats on the lovely earnings this morning, Jamie. You must be feeling great. Yeah, I'm just his nephew or something. Yeah. <laughs> like he's, he's right. just done with Yahoo Finance and CNBC, and he just comes on here afterwards. Um, a lot of the information that we collected uh, about the convertible notes and understanding that offering actually came from uh, a few very smart sources. Um, this was one of them. I'm just going to say what their name is under the tag that they put, whether or not they want to remain anonymous or whatever. But um, everyone, welcome, Martin. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Hey. How you doing? Doing good. How are you guys doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Um, so, so for context, uh, when the senior convertible note the news broke, uh, Martin, who works in... Uh, the banking space helped us break it down at more in just our private SoFi chats. And so everybody in the sort of SoFi analysis community, Chris Hager, Vadim, all these guys, um, you know, Martin was in that group with us helping make sense of that news, which led to a couple of things It led to the video that I made that, you know, the whiteboarding video, um, a couple of the things that Uncle Bruce was saying, he was helping us digest the fine print in terms of when that news came actually when the details on the convertible note offering came out a couple of days later. Um, so yeah, good to have him here. Are, are yeah, we sorry, to ask sorry for not having the camera on, by the way, I've been feeling a bit bad these couple of days. So yeah, not in the most presentable. No, no, no that makes sense. Martin, I just want to ask, um, yeah. are, are, am I able to ask what, what you do for uh, a, a, a job? Like, like what, what industry you're in? Yeah, so um, I'm in finance, I'm in market risk, um, I'm a group manager, I work uh, for a legacy bank. Um, so my education was also evolved around finance. Um, so I was quite familiar with some of the terms and, you know, these deals are becoming very mainstream. Um, I know a lot of people initially, they were, you know, um, scared of what this deal means, you know, the stock price action, but, you know, I personally try to not focus too much on the stock price, but rather why it was done. Um, and Noto on the talk with Jim Cramer, he couldn't have explained it better in a short, concise way. Mm. Um, and I feel like people should just take it for what he said um, by a simple Google of, you know, those term deals, you could see 
at least, I don't know, 100 other companies doing similar deals where the terms um, and the the writing and, you know, uh, the wording on, on the deal is almost identical. So that in itself can, you know, tell you that this is really standard. Um, personally, I think it was a really great move by Noto, um, simply given that he retired some higher um, interest debt uh, for some much cheaper debt. Um, and I think for one of the pieces, he didn't really have a choice. His hands were tied. Um, so it was going to go from like 12% to about 17% and he couldn't even do anything for the next five years right. if he didn't do it by May. Um, so I think it's a very smart move. It also frees up some capital. So um, I think they're in a great position to get the, the ball rolling. And for 2024, they're being quite conservative. Um, so that also plays into that plan. Um, and honestly, like I'm very happy with with how they're managing the company um, in such an environment. I'd be, you know, some people would get more excited about, uh, you know, management talking about growth all the time and doing this, doing that. But reality is we're not in the best environment right now. Um, we're seeing banks and, you know, legacy institutions cutting back, cutting employees. And, you know, that affects into us smaller companies as well. So the fact that they're um, conscious about that and um, taking that into account speaks volumes to me. So can I ask, because um, we we got introduced to you uh, during the actual convertible uh, offering. Was this a position that that you were interested in as well or just trying to be sort of a good Samaritan and help a couple of uh, normies understand more of a complex deal that actually happened? I personally do hold uh, SoFi. Um, I was introduced to it by Tev a while ago, uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, and I started, you know, reading more and more about it. And, you know, working uh, for a legacy bank, you also start um, seeing some things that work better, things that could be improved. Um, and, you know, being of a younger generation, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've been at a, at a branch. So, you know, those were small things that got me into reading more and more about so far and you know i just love the whole uh fintech side of it so um the management team is also has also done tremendously like in the last two three years this environment has not been great to say the least and for them to you know every single time beat expectations stay calm you know have the ability to shift from one business to another um, depending on the, the macro environment it's just phenomenal so um, do you guys have any questions for Martin or can I go ahead? Roy. Well, I do. Um, so you mentioned, you know, interest in the tech platform. Why do you think it is that, uh, so many that are, uh, you know, as far as analysts and everything are looking at the company and just overlooking the tech platform for the most part, we've seen a little bit of shift and what would you guess it would actually take to kind of shift that perspective? So like, um, I'll put it out there thing. I, the problem I have with a lot of analysts is they're very short sighted. Um, first on their ratings, their ratings are usually for a 12 month period. They're not going to talk to give you ratings on, you know, what's going to happen in the next three, five years and whatnot. Also, another thing is I don't see SoFi rating other banks or other institutions. Um, and the real story here, here is SoFi is going against giants. Um, so going against giants, you're not going to have an easy path. You're not going to go down without a fight. Um, so, you know, you, you have to think about all that. There's a lot of stuff that goes on the background that people don't necessarily see. Um, you know, I'm not saying that I've ever been part of those things or seen that happen, but I am a firm believer that the world we live in is not all rainbows and sunshine. So, um, SoFi has a great product, has a great management team, and I just tend to focus on that. I don't care about the stock price. Um, I only see that, hey, if it's seven, seven, five, even if it goes to 11, am I going to sell? Heck no. Um, so if it's seven, seven, five, I'll keep buying more. You know, management hasn't given me a reason to uh, not believe in them. In terms of the tech platform, um, as I said, analysts are very one sided. So very few of them are going to have, you know, true, honest uh, research. Um, and, you know, legacy banks don't really have the, the biggest, or I guess the best 
tech stack behind them. Um, and probably one of the reasons why SoFi hasn't really announced anything yet is simply because if one bank, if they some come out and say, hey, we have a deal with City, that there is also a uh, acceptance on City side that their tech stuff sucks. So it gets the ball rolling from there. Um, but yeah, I think it's, they just want to value it as a bank because it's more beneficial for them to value it as a bank. Uh, the TAC platform, I think, is going to be a giant beast um, in the next couple of years. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see how, how it happens. Uh, I wanted to ask because um, I still see a lot of questions come up regarding the convertible note offering and whether or not them getting rid of the uh, preferred shares and some of the higher cost um, debt that they had. <clears throat> Sorry. Do you think that this will actually bring uh, more EPS to the bottom line? And, and how does the dilution play into that? And um, I'll ask you another question after that regarding it, but maybe I won't swamp you. Yeah, so for the dilution piece, um, I saw a very interesting comment uh, when this note thing was being talked about. Um, if, you know, them having more capital on hand and having more flexibility on doing things leads to more improvement in the business and then all of a sudden you know that dilution i mean through some math calculation would happen to be around 16 70 dollars and 17 dollars and so on um because that's why they have had those uh, call options to protect themselves up from the dilution up until that point um but you know if you have a stock price of 30 40 i mean we're talking what now 5x from here like would you really care yeah you yeah know, exactly how much of a dilution is that like bring it on to me in my in my opinion so so uh, for context why this is still relevant and important for just people watching is because all of these analyst upgrades are all quoting the convertible notes as the catalyst for their upgrade they're saying we looked at sofa in january and we looked at sofa today and the balance sheet health is considerably better because they have lower amounts of debt and as a result of that they're going to be retaining more of their capital. Their capital ratios are also increasing quite significantly. And as a result of that, they're, once they plug it into their models, their expectation for Q1, I mean, um, the city analyst uh, said basically, you know, as early as Q1, we're going to see benefits of this. And that's why they're raising their price targets. And so all of this stuff is very related because that convertible note offering is what's changing the tide from a sentiment perspective from all of these analysts. And they're all just dominoing in one by one, starting last week and even this week with Deutsche and City, and probably next week as well, as we head into earnings, all because of this deal that Noto did. So it's still very much relevant because everybody is expecting to see the benefits from this. Yeah, at the same time, though, like from these analyst ratings, like, you know, I, I, I think one of them upgraded from like mid sevens or eights to like 12 with a hold. I mean, how is that a, how is a 50% upside from here, a hold and not a buy? So mm -hmm. like just seeing that, I don't even care to, to read what their reasoning is. And, you know, like they, they, like the analysts sometimes to me, they like to play catch ball and like try to be in the trend. Um, they'll put stuff out there all in unison and all of a sudden seem like, hey, we all understand what's going on here. And then, you know, SoFi stock price goes up to 15, 16, and then you'll see upgrades of prices to like 20. Um, and they're just, again, playing catch bull. Uh, similar thing happened with Palantir. You see similar things happen with Robinhood, um, other stocks out there that, you know, have, you know, big spikes in, in prices in a short time. Um, so, you know, don't take those ratings like 11 12 dollars like even dan dolev like he lowered from 15 to 12 i wouldn't be surprised in six months if he goes to 15 16 again uh with no like super shift and news um so again just take those those price targets as a as a very short term because there are clients that they are sending these ratings to um and they're in the business to make money and usually for big institutions making money is not five-year terms, 10-year terms. It's usually very quick turnovers. Um, and it, it's, not not, it's not a mutual fund or ETF like Kathy would, where she can just easily say it's, five, it's for five years. 
they have to you know keep reiterating re-giving research uh, to their clients and that's how can they can keep them locked that's how they can get their money so but you wouldn't say that or well i don't want to say you wouldn't say uh would you say that these analyst price targets are an attack on sofi or just sort of misinformed and that they're making short-term bets because we hear some comments that this is large banks trying to put um you know a hamper on sofi to try to hurt them in any angle that they could possibly do to to sort of stump that competition do you see it in that direction at all uh i see it in the in like i'll i'll give you just a quick analogy if sofi was for whatever reason um 13 dollars today you'd have the same news same everything right you'd have the price targets of the same analyst at about 17 18 dollars whereas if you have an analyst where the price right now is at 750 and they give all of a sudden 20 price 20 dollar price target their managers people are going to come out and say are you insane like you're talking about 150 percent something must be wrong in your analysis right. whereas when you're talking about 50 percent upside potential um then it, it's a lot different it's a lot more reasonable people will take it a lot more seriously that's why i'm saying like as stock price moves in time they just play catch ball and they just bring out new reiterations new ratings um just to you know be more reasonable in that aspect um so no malice but, intent just trying to be reasonable in their some, direction some of them some of them yes so like the truest guy like he has a really good analysis um analysis um some of them really do point out um uh, real risks um uh, with sofi that everyone should consider absolutely um but some of them are just ridiculous like you know the three dollar price targets like you don't even consider the tech piece you're just i mean you're, you're just a joke of an analyst at that point and from the ratings i mean you're the 7499 guy out of seven seven thousand six hundred like how can i take you seriously your average return is negative 30 percent and now all of a sudden you're going to be the genius um to call this like massive short um but and remember sofa is a real bank they're getting audited in and out you have internal audits you have external audits and i cannot stress enough how stringent those are at our bank you know we get all sorts of questions and they'll dive deep into every single thing they can so the fact that sofi is getting audited both internally and externally and getting signed off on those audits and these are big institutions that are providing those sign offs we're talking about deloitte we're talking about you know big fours they're not just going to mess around um with sofi financial statements and just you know sign off for no reason so that gives a sense of of comfort and of safety with sofi and i feel like some analysts or some people are just banging on the idea that hey how is it possible that the small company has performed so greatly in three years it must either be a scam or they must be messing up something on their financial statements and that i firmly do not believe so that's why there's no chance i could give this this stock like a three dollar price target like it's it's just a joke so i i think that um yeah it's it's best i think because i, I the the perspective that you bring to sofi so stock is super unique because you're very much in the uh what did you say the 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 credit risk market uh, risk. Market, market risk okay um in that case i want to keep you sort of where we could really learn something from but also I wanted to ask you questions about the short the short volume that we're seeing there's the short interest because this is insane what we're seeing at at highs of 23% I think it's currently 17% short interest what are institutions doing here what, what what's the play that's going on it, it, from your perspective I don't have like a full on definitive thought on that like I don't want to say you know institutions are manipulating I never want to lean towards that um but I can say like interests are aligned out there so you know you have institutions working with hedge funds and mutual funds and you know big clients and hey if you want our business blah blah like 
you know, there, there could be, you know, hedgy stuff out there. So um, 17% to me, it's, it's okay. It's whatever. Like you've had Tesla with higher percentages. You've had these stocks. Like I, I don't really tend to place too much emphasis or importance on those numbers. Sure. Um, also, to me, it's kind of stupid shorting. 20 over 20 percent at a seven dollar price target you're like at a current st a stock price of seven dollars like you're almost saying this company is going to fail and for the reasons i explained earlier i don't think that's going to happen um so yeah it's a, it's a lot of questions mark question marks on my head um i don't really want to you know say anything definitive i don't i don't think too much about it to be yeah, quite okay honest. so i was seeing some some comments that you know, the, the strong volatility in the short interest could be hedging as a result of the 2029 convertible note deal, um, like the, the Delta hedging strategy in general, uh, or these, the note holders, essentially the, the ones that get the notes and, and give the money to SoFi to buy the notes, they're the ones that are shorting. Is there anything there? Maybe, I'm not sure if you can, but to expand on that, because this went from 23 to 17 in a matter of two weeks, right? And so that's a pretty big fluctuation uh, in such a short period of time in such close proximity to that convertible note offering. I uh, I don't know too much details on exactly how um, that Delta hedging would work. I do know, however, that uh, some of the players that you know, are involved in those uh, convertible notes and that, you know, buy those from from uh, SoFi, they might have the interest to um, short the stock, especially because, um, um, you know, you're going to get a smaller price when you can convert shares. So you, you effectively get more shares uh, from that note. So that initially is what you saw the, the stock price reaction. Noda also explained it on, the, on, on Jim Kramer. Um, it also has happened with a lot of companies. It's happened with Uber as well. Um, but yeah, that initial stock reaction is known. It's it, it's it has happened with other companies before. So um, there is definitely, I think, some sort of strategy behind it. Um, and it also coincides with you know the short interest dropping materially these last two weeks without any you know reasonable major news coming out. So. But yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly how how they can um, or how the the hedging works, and you know who sells what is spe specifically. But yeah, I'll probably have to look into that. Martin, um, <clears throat> I also got asked in the chat um, from Sigig here. They said, "Can we ask Martin how likely he believes SoFi is an acquisition target, um, potentially from other?" large inst or large financial institutions perhaps uh could be probably not right now um not i don't think right now i also think noda is going to do anything he can to not be acquired i don't think he's going for that deal um i think if he was thinking about that he probably would have thought of an a way out i mean stock price has been really compressed we don't even know if he's going to get you know his rewards by 2026 um so if he wanted a way out he would have found one uh, mm. he ranks to me like a champion of a guy like an alpha male so you know he's in it for the win i think he wants sofi to be um, his legacy how he is remembered um he kind of strikes me of uh similar to jp morgan ceo um, you know, where he pretty much built it from ground out. So um, I think SoFi is here to stay. Um, and even if it becomes an acquisition target, I don't think it's coming at a cheap price. So, I mean, we're all going to get rewarded if that's the case. Uh, but I also think that if they do get acquired, Noto is going to lead um, a good department. So it would make me interested in the company that acquires them. They will uh, effectively own the technology and all that. So, you know, it's you change the name of the stock, but your I mean, thesis still stands on the other stock that acquired you. I was going to ask as well, um, what whenever I don't know if potentially you uh, have heard Tevis's comments about SoFi and the way that uh, myself or him look into the company. 
Is there anything that you can add uh, from your perspective on a different way of looking at this company or something that potentially you think that we're just completely missing out on or how potentially you value it or see it or, or any risks associated with SoFi technology? There's definitely risks in it. Um, again, like the macro environment right now is, is not ideal. Um, I think we still haven't seen, you know, like the economy has been handled relatively well. Um, you know, you don't see big defaults or you don't see, you know, big unemployment numbers, uh, which is the reason why they've kept rates the way they are. And, you know, we went from all of a sudden six rate cuts expected, expected to two or even one this year. Um, so there are definitely risks there. I think this year and next year will be relatively tough unless um, things change. It's, uh, it's a situation I don't think we've had before, which makes it really interesting. Um, and SoFi is an interest rate sensitive company. You have, I mean, you're talking about um, the loan book and all of these things, like depending on how rates uh, go in the future, that could really impact, you know, how they decide to do originations or uh, package loans and, you know, securitize them and how they're valued. So that's a, that's a real risk there. Um, and then, you know, their growth these couple of years has been really maintained by the loan origination piece. So, you know, if you have even high FICO score, people start defaulting on those loans, um, then it becomes a real problem. But the numbers are that the data is not showing that as of yet. Um, and yeah, so I don't think there's a, a big concern at this moment, but those are real risks to be considered. And at the same time, the biggest risk I think with SoFi is you have a puppy going against bulldogs. That to me is the biggest risk. Um, and you know, SoFi is coming to eat their dinner. It's not, it's not, I mean, if you had a company that's going for Amazon or is going for Google and they're just such a small company, like think of the, the probability that, you know, that happens. Um, so that is something that everybody has to consider. But that's also the same criticism Tesla was getting, Amazon was getting at this time. Um, so yeah, definitely be mindful out there. I think these are the, the biggest risks. Um, I personally am at a, at a young age. So um, I have, I live by some ideals and morals and I think SoFi fits all of them. Um, I, I mean, as soon as I started my job, I, I've seen the world in different lenses and, you know, I really stand by the morals of SoFi and the team, uh, the management team. So it's something I want to support, uh, something that motivates me personally as well. And when those two things match, it's a good enough reason for me to invest in. Um, once that changes, then obviously I will reallocate. But even in the case where SoFi doesn't, you know, perform as I intended to, um, I'm at a young age, so I can, you know, I can recover that loss. Um, so yeah, these are these are the major risks I'd say. Um, but again, you're you're talking, you're looking at a great management team. It's a it's a new fun thing. Um, I don't know. I I can't say enough. I it, this company just gets me excited. I have majority of my portfolio in it, so. Um, as I said, because of my age, I can afford to do that. I can afford to take more risk, but everybody should be mindful of the macro environment we're in right now. Um, and I think it's going to be tougher in the coming months. So Martin, can I ask a question real quick? You mentioned yeah. Robin Hood and Palantir before I know this is SoFi Weekly. I'm just curious if you're holding those personally, or if that's just, you mentioned them as examples. I just mentioned them as examples. I do look at them, uh, closely. I really like uh, Robinhood for their UI platform. Uh, they're very friendly um, to use and user friendly. I mean, um, and I wish SoFi would also do something like that with uh, Invest, but they're two different uh, companies. One thing I didn't really like particularly uh, in the last two weeks was when uh, Robinhood came out with a credit card. Everybody was just jumping out of excitement. Hey, it's 3% here. You know, why isn't SoFi doing this? I don't like to compare one with the other. They're going for different market shares and the UI. I don't think people invest in SoFi 
just particularly for the you, uh, the invest portion of it, I think it's a lot bigger, and that invest portion is actually just a small piece. Um, so it could be a great. I mean, SoFi is going to be the one stop shop, so it definitely has to have that in it. Uh, but just comparing SoFi and Robinhood, like apples to it's not apples to apples to me. Um, another thing is a lot of companies right now are trying to be the exciting thing in the market. So. I also saw the Robin Hood, you know, 3% credit card. It, it's a great idea, but the math really has to math with it. It's like, to me, it's a, it's a make or break. Um, it's a, it's a risky offering. And also, I also like to advise people that, you know, when you see hot, interesting news come out, really read into it before getting excited because the first few days you had people talking about Robin Hood. Hey, nobody's matching Robin Hood. You know, Robin Hood was the most talked thing for those two days. And then the third day, the fourth day, people say, hey, but I don't get the full match unless I stay with them five years. Maybe it's not that great of a deal. And I was telling Tev too, like, Tev was so excited as well in the beginning. I was telling Tev, like, hey, if it's if it looks too good, it's it probably is too good to be true. There's probably something in it. So it, it's a great idea, but they really have to hit every uh, every point um, to make it successful. And yeah, I, it's it's not something that you know. I would take money out of SoFi to put into Robinhood because of that three percent. Like it's not that type of exciting. They didn't invent the you know the flying car or whatever. Um, yeah. Just kidding. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and then the fact I love more uh, is that Noto didn't go after it. Like a lot of people were saying, hey, Noto, what do you have? Blah, blah, blah. He's a smart man. He's not playing cards because people tell him to. He's not going to give you a 4% credit card or 5% credit card so he can fight with Robin Hood. He manages his company and the dude stays calm regardless of, you know, what's out there. And people like that managers like that you know ceos like that they they survive it's it's a long run game it's it's who stays in longer it's not who's more exciting in the next month or two yeah that's that's exactly how i see it i you know that's i my so far is a very long term position and robin hood's a trade just because there is a there's a more cyclicality in uh, robin hood and uh, there's a lot of excitement which is great for a trade but long term like they're just building a, a massive foundation and i think that they're going to become an unstoppable juggernaut but you know if they were just trying to copy robin hood uh i mean there's some things that they could certainly do better and improve on but uh, it introduces an element of risk if they do something like the robin hood gold card so i i love what i have i love you know that you have that same understanding of that mindset that they're what they're doing so i appreciate that perspective yeah, absolutely. And it honestly would go against what they guided for. They did say we're going to be conservative. And now all of a sudden, if, you know, they come out with these exciting stuff, like I would see it as a sign of distraction. It would concern me more than anything. The fact that they're being conservative, the fact that we may see that on the first quarter, it's not going to sway me. They stick by their word. That's all that matters to me. So do you have if, any, do you have any yeah. unique... Uh... Q1 earnings predictions, Martin? Uh, I was on the list. Well, I saw a lot of analysts didn't even put an average of like one cent. And I'm like, okay, guys, like, come on. It's not even like half a cent, you know, let alone like one cent. So I think, I don't think it's going to be a blowout. I think it's going to be around one to two cents. Um, but members' number is going to be interesting. They signed major deals. Uh, the NBA, NBA deal, I think, is is going to play values as well. Um, we're seeing that logo everywhere. I mean, the NBA is one of the most followed leagues in the U.S. and in the world. Um, so having that major partnership um, and also attack, like going for, you know, top sports icons, like you have Jason Tatum, you have, uh, I don't watch golf as much, um, but I saw that they signed a, a big guy on golf. Wyndham well. Clark. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they're, they're going up, like, you have to think about who the target market is for SoFi. They're young, uh, people, you know, prone to technology, um, and young people tend to follow these sports and be excited about sports. So 
you know, the, it, it all makes sense in that in that uh, frame. So, yeah, I think I think members numbers are, are going to come in uh, good this quarter, uh, but we'll see. I, I don't know too much about um, how the loan piece is going to work. Like, I don't if they did guide for 92 to 95 percent of what they had before. So it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out. Like Dan Dolov said completely the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, on his interview so that was quite interesting to me um so yeah i mean chris has also said um on a bunch of his tweets that this is the hardest quarter to predict on what's going to happen um but yeah i, I do i do also agree with with his opinion so yeah let's see data driven investing right that's who you're referring to yes okay yeah. so yeah it, it's going to be interesting Interesting to see, but yeah, I think we do came in at, at least one cent. <clears throat> um, the last question that I have personally is uh, what you referenced as, you know, SoFi being a puppy versus these bulldogs. Uh, that's going to be pretty hard to go up against. Is it just mainly the management is what you're placing bets on? Or what What makes you think that SoFi even has a has a chance? Management, I think, is one of the key piece, pieces why people even invest in stocks. Um, you have Palantir, people invest because of Alex Carp. You have Tesla, take Elon out now and then see what happens to Tesla stock. You'll have it 50% down tomorrow. Sure. Um, so because at the end of the day, they're the people that are making the decisions. They're the people that are, you know, driving the company and the stock price follows they're not per se you know looking at the, the stock price on a daily basis not just going to their office and you know banging their heads on the wall and saying oh stocks at seven five they don't care you know they're getting members and and all that stuff another thing what has what has gotten me into sofi is noto knows the legacy world he was in it you know um that's why i like him i'm in the legacy world right now i know it so he did see things that there that, that could have been improved um and he said you know what i'm gonna do it on my own um so he knows that side he knows how they function he knows he knows the environment very very well um and for him to take on this mission um you know he knows what he's up against uh, he was top rated at his legacy bank as well so you're not talking about just you know one ceo out of the blue like this guy is you know he's for real um so one of the biggest reasons i'm invested in sofi is because of him and i know that is another big risk similar to tesla uh, key men risk you know take them out of the equation uh you have you know different stories behind and different theses right um, which is why you know you have a lot of fud around people live like the president of sofi bank like leaving um, and, you know, the CRO being replaced and all that stuff. Like, you know, people place bets on SoFi because of management more than anything. Um, and once that shifts, then it can change stuff. But, yeah, I definitely think management is is the major point here. Um, <clears throat> so can, can I ask you a question? Jonathan has a question. He says, yeah. is Martin using an AI voice? <laughs> digitizer to hide his identity from quote unquote legacy bank you don't have to answer that one martin but it's <laughs> funny yes <laughs> um i don't see actually many questions everyone's just trying to find figure out your identity so uh <laughs> we'll let you go scot free um the whole idea of having someone like this on the channel is that you ask them you know exciting questions uh, oh, hold on. Uh, did he listen to the Gary Gordon interview? Where do you think Gary Gordon is wrong and what specifically? Tanner's biased, so obviously he's not going to pick up that question for you to ask because he loves Gary. I, I, I swear I didn't see that question. No, I didn't. I haven't heard his interview. What was it about? That no, is okay. the correct answer. Moving on. Yeah. I yeah. love whenever I put the camera on Tevis, it just kills his mood. It's the, my favorite part of the podcast is how fast he changes. L look at him. <laughs> well, um, the camera's about to cut off in a second. Martin, chances we touch $11 in May? I'm just in reading. May? In May. 
probably tough. I'd say around nine is what we're looking at right now. Um, again, remember, they're being conservative this year. Um, I do think we do see tens again this year, um, but I wouldn't expect too, too much other than that. Um, again, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in terms of macro environment. It's not like a lot of the SoFi stock price is not also even related to SoFi. One other thing that I've been noticing, um, I do say that I don't like to follow the stock price, but as a matter of fact, I had to have a bunch of stocks on my computer every day that I do see the, the price action on. And one of the things that would piss me most when I was an early investor into SoFi, you know, I was emotional because, hey, I put money into it. I wanted to double in a month and so on. Um, it it takes a toll on you. Like SoFi, it, it's not for the weak. It's, you know, this stock is, you need some, you know, you need to be really good with your emotions to, to hold this stock because, you know, it will go down on a good day and you have all the other banks or all the other tech companies going up and stuff like going down so you know it really makes you question your decision um but honestly what i've loved with sofi price action lately it's not trading the same as a firm or upstart and you saw firm earnings before or upstart going down five percent and you know sofi would go down seven or eight because of something related to them now it's completely detached. Like I wouldn't be surprised if you look at their price action in the last three to four months and saw a very small uh, correlation. Um, so, you know, that detachment and SoFi getting its own identity is I think a shift in sentiment that is gonna play volumes moving forward. And last year you were building a base around three, four dollars. Now you're very solidly staying around seven, seven and a half. Um, and you know, at it's early guys. Like we just had a first quarter of profitability. Like how exciting is that? You know, give it time. It's a new company. It's a puppy. As I said, you know, let the puppy grow. So I think in a year time, we're going to see very different results. More funds are going to flow money into SoFi because of all their, the mandates they have. Some funds are not even allowed to invest in SoFi until they have a full year of profitability or until they're at 10 billion market cap. You know, so for all those reasons, um, you know, you see a volatility in stock price right now, but as they grow, as they show more stability and, you know, profitability, I think that whole story is going to change. What uh, percentage of SoFi is Martin holding? Oh, is that a guess or should I just say? No, I, I'm, I'm reading one of the questions in the chat. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, it's 60% right now. Sorry. Uh... Can you say that again? 60% of my portfolio right now. Uh, do you only hold common shares? Yes. For uh, reasons that, uh, unfortunately, I can't play too much with options because uh, in legacy banks, when you're working at certain departments um, or in any institution, you know, that is handling with, with clients or dealing with clients, you, there are very strict uh, trading policies to where you are supposed to only hold uh, a position for at least 30 days. Um, you're not allowed, you know, very frequent trading. And I wouldn't like to, you know, buy options and not have to make a decision or, or do something with them. Um, you know, options are very powerful. So uh, you need to really know how to handle them. And, you know, having that trading restri restriction, up, unfortunately, it's not, it, it's not worth my time right now. So I'm just building a position and holding common shares. So could I, I, I don't know if I understood that. Are you saying that um, the bank that you work under mm -hmm. is is uh, controlling the way that you trade in your personal account? Or are you talking about a corporate account or, or some sort of uh, like money that you're managing for clients? No, no, it's, it's personal account. So you know, you work for a legacy, you work for a, a bank, let's say, right? Your whole paycheck and your whole investment accounts need to be with the bank. And in that trading policy, uh, there are there are different time frames where you can trade. So there's certain stocks that you're not even allowed to trade because the bank has, you know, ongoing relationships with them. So that's mm -hmm. like a trading restriction, for example. Another trans trading restriction is they don't want you to be going in and out of trades because during market hours, you're supposed to be doing the job for one and not be trading stocks. That makes sense. Um, and at the same time, you're not, they don't want you to, you know, create volatility in the market and, you know, be doing all these kinds of things. So 
they 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 only allow you to uh, buy a stock if you're holding it for 30 days and only in circumstances where the stock price let's say drops at 30 or 40 percent and you just want to take your money out so that you you know you'll have more losses they do allow you to to sell the stock uh but other than that you do have unfortunately that 30 percent or sorry 30 day uh restriction and they do monitor that so some people also they have to ask for permission to trade a certain stock before they trade it i was so, going to say do they yeah. also monitor the the risk of your portfolio as well it, it not necessarily um because it's my own portfolio it's personal it just has to be a verified portfolio like it, it can't be let's say with um uh quest trade let's say like quest trade is in one of their like non-verified whatever dealers and every time you trade or place a trade with them because their systems are not integrated to the point where have a full view 24 7 of what you do so every time you trade you need it to um, get permission but if your account is with the bank itself, um, then they have full, you know, monitoring on it. And it's very easy for them to raise flags or do anything like that. So for the, for reasons like that, and for the fact that I just uh, want to invest long term, um, I could buy leaps. Uh, I've been th thinking about that. I mean, it does fall into things I'm allowed to do, essentially. So uh, but yeah, I personally have just wanted to build my position at these low prices, and I've just gone for pure common shares. Well, perfect. Um, Roy, Tevis, do you guys have any other questions or? I'm curious if there's any interesting insight given the background in risk that you can share from just a legacy bank perspective or any interesting perspective in that sense with that corresponds to SoFi or the entire industry. Like I'm sure a lot of people in the chat didn't know about the restrictions that a legacy bank would put on your personal account for, you know, you have to disclose these trades. And even though it's your personal account, there's a lot more like that that you encounter on a daily basis that gives you an edge um, in understanding a stock like SoFi. So if there's anything that you can think of like that. Yeah. So on my day to day job, like honestly, like some of these restrictions, they apply more to certain departments than others but you have to think like some of these institutions they only have one department dealing with all like one hr department or one governance department dealing with you know seven different uh branches of of the bank bank um or subsidiaries of the bank they're not they don't have enough people or you know enough time to um, make the rules different for each separate department so some of these, like the information I deal on on a day-to-day -day basis, even for the stocks that they have on their uh, full restricted list, I don't have superficial information for me to go on and make a decision that, hey, this is a buy today. So I don't deal with that type of risk. I mostly deal with uh, risk on the on the full sense of, of the bank on the top of house level, um, where, you know, products that the bank deals with the clients, you know how much losses they're exposed to on a on a daily basis how much they can lose with with a certain percentage of confidence in the next week or so um and you know be able to communicate that type of risk to leadership so that they can you know place the appropriate limits um and and you know the appropriate strategies to the to the trading desks so i don't have any information on on stocks per se but i do take care of portfolios that do trade stocks, but not on a proprietary basis. They're mostly uh, trading stocks or holding positions to make a market for for clients. So you're like the nerdy analyst from Margin Call saying that. <laughs> I'm thinking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'm like sure that. that the trading guys need to start doing a fire sale and. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I like to be the guy who you know uh, builds that house of whatever Jenga's. And I do have the analysts who say, "Do you see my mathematician here?" <laughs> but uh... oh, okay, I know, yeah. I know you're talking about the quant, uh. the quant. But uh, no, I do deal with a lot of numbers on a daily basis, and um, I can say that, like, 100% of the macro environment is, is not as stable because we do get a lot of workload when you know the market is volatile. Um, you know, there's certain portfolios that are exposed to more volatility, so. Um, yeah, definitely the workload is out there, whereas in more normal times, it will be a lot easier. So it, it's not a great environment. And 
there's again this huge uncertainty on what the what the actions are going to be it's an election year you have biden coming out and saying you know there's going to be a rate cut and then for all we know there should be a complete independence between fed and the president so it's like how is he coming out with these statements so the market is very, very volatile because it doesn't know what to read from who at this point and until we get a clear picture um I think it's it's just I, I just like to see it as an opportunity for me to grab cheap shares from companies I like, and you know it's getting very hard out there to to read the correct information. So until we get a clearer picture, um, it's going to be a bit of a rocky road. Uh, Mohammed uh, put a good question in the chat here. He said, "Whenever you're looking back on the convertible note deal." Um, what did you think about the actual stock price and how it reacted to that deal versus what you know about it? So as I said earlier, like that stock price drop is expected. Um, and it did happen with a lot of other companies that do these types of deals. So it's a known thing um, as soon as the announcement comes out. Um, again, it's not ideal because for a lower stock price, your uh, the convertible notes can be converted into more uh, shares potentially. So that means uh, ideal, like technically more dilution, but that's why they had that, uh, you know, protective call option. So sure. uh, up until a certain point, that doesn't really matter. Um, and then, as I said, like if it goes to 20, 30, I don't care, right? I've made my money. Um, so it was worth it in the sense that I was able to get some cheap shares because I know how these deals work. And I knew the purpose of that deal i knew that noto was you know essentially refinancing a 12 percent loan with something much cheaper you know getting rid of those preferred shares um so on that sense it only made sense for me to to buy um and a lot of people that did i think like even for a swing trade it, it was good um but yeah i didn't i didn't make much of it like it wasn't a moment where you know, the stock price dropped 15%. I, I didn't think it was granted to drop 15% in all honesty. Um, but the fact that it dropped 15% is not like, I was like, oh my God, let me sell. No, like I just went out and bought more. Well, Martin, this has been awesome. Um, everyone, please give a, a big thank you to Martin uh, in the chat because this was uh, great. And hopefully you join us even more and you're more than welcome to join us in the after hour show if you have the time if not if you're not feeling great that's perfectly fine as well but um you might hear it from tevis afterwards uh <laughs> is there anything else roy tevis that you want to say before we wrap no well until next time guys thank you so much for watching bye for now